We could all stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I was going to say, we always start our, oh, there's Wendy. <laughs> so we do always start our meetings off with uh, public uh, comment. And I just wanted to see, I mean, there's probably not much to comment about, but if anyone wants to say anything before we start, I'm going to give everyone the opportunity. No hands up? If everyone could please mute if you're online, I'd appreciate it, unless you have a question. I see John Strauss. You have a question before we start? Thank you. John, are you muted, I think? Okay. All right. All right. Well, well, we're going to interview the <laughs> our, our our first. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and interview. Well, what, first of all, this is our uh, uh, high school building designer committee. My name is Catherine Bond, and I'm the chair. And this is Martha Simon, our vice chair. And um, again, I'd like to just inter have you all introduce yourselves. And I m hope I say it right. Is it Tape? Got it. So um, they're going to be the, the first people doing their presentation. And maybe if you can just, either if you have the um, quick introduction within your presentation, that's great. Or if you want to introduce yourselves right now, either way, just let me know. Oh, if everybody could, yes. Yes, we didn't have to be on yes, the mic. Yes, yeah, you have to I, be I uh, very close to the mics, and the green light has to be on. So your mouth, mouth needs to be very close so everyone online can hear, please. I feel like I'm in a Senate hearing at the moment, <laughs> so, so for, which I never thought I'd be at, but forgive me. Uh, so my name is Charlie Hay, and I am um, a principal at Tape Architects, and I will be the principal in charge for the project. And thank you very much for... Uh, seeing us this evening. We have kind of a cast of uh, thousands here with us, but uh, we're very excited about the project. Excellent. Oh. My name is Wendy Hines, and I'm the Director of Interior Design. Uh, David Gould. I'm the Project Manager from Tape. Uh, I'm Cesar De Dios. I'm uh, the Technical Principal at Tape. Jen Littlefield, I am an associate and the director of construction administration. Hi, I'm David Warner. I'm president of Warner Larson Landscape Architects, and I've been working with TAPE for over 20 years. I'm Jess Farber, mechanical engineer with CMCA, and I'll be leading the sustainability and system selection effort for the project. And good evening. I'm David Steven with New Vista Design. I'm the educational programmer on the team, and I've worked with TAPE on four projects over the last five years. And I am Chris Blesson, and I'm one of the design principals at uh, Tape Architect, and will be uh, going lead with David on this project um, as we go forward. So uh, we'll turn it back to you before we start our presentation. Thank you very much for the introductions. So I did want to add one more thing. I know there are people already online, but I usually uh, give out the phone number. Um, the meeting number is 2346309-1888, and the password is Burlington, and this meeting is also being broadcast on BCAT. All right, so go ahead and start. All right. We're all ears. <laughs> so let me get to the share here. All right, we have a good signal? Okay, all right, so I'm Chris, uh, as I said, just uh, 
second ago, and the I, I'm the design principal on this project alongside uh, David Gold as the PM, and I'll lead sort of the day-to-day -day operations as we launch into the project. Um, but we're also supported by this highly capable and accomplished team that you see behind us and um, a bunch of others that are not with us tonight. Um, and as you're expecting, we are going to cast a lot at you in the next 45 minutes. Um, and so to make sure that you have a way to recall that, and because we also are the first to present, um, we've made these little, uh, little pamphlet things that Cesar will hand out to you. But these are really just an aid for you we want to make sure that you know that we answered your questions clearly and concisely, and this will give you a way to refer back to that, um, a, a way to refer back to that when you do your deliberations, um, whenever that may be. Um, so over this time, our focus is going to be laying the foundation for the TAPE legacy in designing schools in Massachusetts specifically. And we will be discussing uh, the unique challenges of your site, represented in part by the site model that we've made and uh, presenting innovative ideas for your high school. One of the unique aspects of our team uh, today is Jess from CMTA. He already introduced himself, and he's serving as the sustainability director. Uh, unlike traditional roles that you may see on some project teams, we've positioned CMTA in a directing role to ensure that your needs are met. And the way this serves you is that it makes an overseeing companion to the design team, but it commissions the design all the way through every phase of development, not just when you start getting into CDs and, and construction. We're doing this commissioning effort from the beginning, and so they're overseeing that and making sure that your long-term goals come to fruition at every phase. And behind the scenes, Cesar, who you just met handing things out, leads our technical response and is an expert in codes, which includes the stretch codes, which you've asked about, and specialty codes. Um, which we could dive into exhaustively if you really wanted to, but we assumed that, uh, that you want to know that we have a depth and breadth with that. Um, you won't hear from Cesar specifically in the presentation, but we brought him in case you have questions and you want to unleash that line, we'll go ahead and do it. Um, so this is also sort of a model to show you what's available to you during design and construction, is that we've got a robust team. You can call on any of us at any time, and we're going to respond with uh, the high-quality effort that, um, that we have. And so to kick things off, I'm going to turn it over to Jen. Um, she's one of the most tenacious uh, construction administrators uh, that I've run across in my career. Um, but she's going to provide insights into our firm. And then following that, David will delve into some specific, specific details about our team. Thanks, Chris. So TAPE's experience with de designing educational projects in Massachusetts is quite extensive. We are a local firm, a smaller firm with a big capacity to, and expertise to handle these large publicly funded school projects. This map shows our completed school projects that are in close proximity to Burlington. Each one has been touched by a member of this team. Because we have worked on so many projects in the immediate area, we have a deep understanding of the local environment and, co and construction climate. Most of our staff and consultants are also local to Massachusetts, so we are allows us to serve our clients with a very personalized experience. TAPE is passionate about creating schools. We see every project as an opportunity to learn from and develop the program with the administrators and staff to ensure that the appropriateness and flexibility of the design for the immediate users. We've honed our quality control and employ cost-effective measures to enable the districts to construct beautiful, healthy, and durable buildings. A timeline of our school projects, our high school projects, demonstrates that we have consistently been engaging in designing and constructing high schools throughout the state going back several decades and beyond. The last 10 to 15 years in particular, the core team that we have here today has been working together on many of these projects. We have a cumulative of over 100 years of experience working together at TAPE. The depth of knowledge and experience that our team ensures, of our team, ensures that every project we are involved with will be a success. Our firm size and carefully planned workload allow us to see all projects to completion with a high level of care and attention, while also working with new clients in programming and design phases. As you can see, most of our current projects are in the bidding or construction phase, so we have a significant capacity for studies and design work. We are approaching all of the projects in construction as a team effort, 
There's a single lead person for each project with other staff supplementing the efforts on an as-needed basis. This means that the primary team members assigned to your project during design would not be a lead on one of the construction projects. Your team will be available to focus on completing each phase of your project per your schedule. As the Director of Construction Administration, my primary job is to make sure our firm responds well to all things construction. I also bring back real-time lessons learned and constructability feedback to the team while projects are in design. And now to talk more about the design process at Tepe and more specifically about project management, here is the first of the Davids you will hear from this evening. Thank you, Jeff. So the design approach at Tepe is a team approach. We are broken down into principals, project managers, and technical de design staff. All of us work collaboratively together and use each other as resources. As Jen said earlier, on, as you can see on this slide, we have over 100 years of experience working together at Tepe. And if you take our outside experience working at other firms that we bring to this firm, that's 150 years of experience that we're bringing to your project. Looking at the design team's core availability, you'll see that everybody is touching the project at one phase or another. Um, however, my primary focus is going to become this project in the long run, and I'll help serve um, the design and take it through a successful funding vote. I've worked on a few projects that have similarities to the Burlington High School project, uh, mainly the Belmonte School in Saugus, which is a brutalist concrete building similar to Burlington High School. Um, there were a number of lessons learned that I gathered from that as a project manager on that project. Um, and I'll just run through, the, through those quickly for you. Um, the first item is discovery. And that has to do with going to the building and exploring it and documenting everything you can in the building. By doing that, you're going to streamline the process later in design because you're going to be able to identify the nooks and crannies of the building and know the ins and outs of it. The second item is knowing your limits, and that deals with understanding how you can work with an existing building like Burlington High School. Uh, it's a concrete structure, and the infrastructure and the components itself are hard to work with. Um, you can't just put a pipe up and down through the floors. You have to learn how to do that correctly. And we have consultants that we work with who are feeding us that information, how to do these things. And by doing that, uh, we'll know more going into the design, and we can design around that. The third item is understanding client goals. You just need to maintain an open line of communication at all times, especially with the client and the OPM. And by doing this, we'll really understand what your needs are, and we can, in the final design, really bring those out. And then the last item is teamwork. Um, in construction, you need to form a good relationship with the contractor from the get-go. Um, you need to understand what their role is in the project, and you need to understand, you need to emphasize teamwork amongst all parties that are working on the project. Taking all four of these elements and applying it directly to Burlington High School is going to help streamline the, the design process, and in the end, it'll help save cost on the product as well. So one of the key decision points for any project is related to the site. I'm going to be heavily involved in exploring the site in the early phases. Um, however, Charlie and David Warner, our landscape architect, have decades of experience doing this. And that's what they're bringing to your project is the experience that they have. I'm going to be working closely with them through the design process. And everything will be clearly communicated back to the building committee and the community. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to David number two, David Warner. <laughs> Okay, thank you, David. Um, good evening again. Let's see. Well, I'm going to the next few slides I'm going to show you are examples of Warner Larson's uh, campus planning that has um, dealing with uh, sites that have similar complexities as as yours, um, and also um, the images we want to uh, convey our design sensibilities. And I'll be pointing out some of the key aspects of these uh, campus designs. So this is the Sharon High School project. You'll see later in the presentation as well when Charlie talks about phasing. This is a project we did with TAPE and just recently completed. Um, and one of the things I really want to emphasize is that regardless of the constraints that we're working with, 
our vision is on the final solution, the final site plan. We don't want uh, the constraints to dictate um, a solution that is compromising in any way. So you can see in this, in this plan here, the original building is gone. You'll see that later. But how everything uh, flows together, like the pedestrian promenade that goes across the front of the building, connecting the student parking lot over to the left side of the screen, all the way across to the campus to the stadium and the new athletic building. Uh, and all of those pedestrian connections feed off from a safe, separate bus and car drop off. The Bill Rickham Memorial High School is a project that uh, Warner Larson designed the campus for uh, with Perkins and Will. And the original building stretched from the foreground all the way to the building you can see in the back left, which is their police fire and town hall. Um, it was largely a one-story building. It occupied a lot of the site. And it involved um, some partial demolition, actually, uh, to allow this new building to be located where it is. Uh, currently located. Um, I think that one of the formative design elements here that I'd like to point out is again sort of a pedestrian oriented campus which um, all the way, goes all the way through the middle of the campus. If you see the, the walkways in the lower right and how they go back by the stadium, all of the site program ties into that. And again, no evidence of the constraints that we had to work with. Um, and then another project with TAP A was the Southbridge Middle School High School. <coughs> and uh, I think this one's interesting because it uh, does have similar constraints as uh, your Burlington High School site with a lot of um, wetland resource areas and streams. Uh, and you can see how the building and then the site program is fitting in uh, between those. This image uh, is intended to get, convey some of our design sensibilities when it comes to those areas of significance. When you, the front of the building, when you're approaching the building, what does it feel like? What does it look like? Is it welcoming? Is it inviting? And uh, you know, these walls in the foreground were actually an abstraction of the geology of the site, where the glaciers had scraped off the ledges, and we were able to sort of uh, interpret those as seat walls. Um, and then we have these pedestrian connections, um, like you saw those little wood, woodland areas that were protecting the wetlands. Well, we still have to get from point A to point B. And you're going to have to do some of that at the Burlington High School site, too, with the way the wetlands sort of weave through. Um, we can provide this in an accessible manner for you know, pedestrians and, and students on bicycles. And this one I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, it's a project we did with KBA Architects, um, and it's at the Marshall Simons Middle School. We, there was this connector that uh, came across at the front of the building and created this courtyard space. And how do we handle you know, challenges like that? Making sure that we don't bring maintenance equipment, lawnmowers, and, and a lot of materials in and out. Uh, we use permeable pavers and really created spaces for outdoor learning and, and dining. So now I'm going to talk uh, briefly about your site and the constraints as we know it. We've got this model in front of us that reflects the existing conditions, so we'll also be referring to that. Um, but your, your site is comprised of um, six different parcels, and um, you know the building obviously is at the extremity of the south. We've realized that Mount Hope, Hope Christian School is on a lease, long-term lease, um, and it's also landlocked by wetlands as well as the um, wooded area to the northwest off of Lexington Street. So we're, we're focused on um, you know, the area that you can see that's not shaded as um, we've got the setback lines around the periphery um, and the driveway coming in. I've got other slides um, that I'm going to show you for circulation. But take a look at that purple outline. That's the current FEMA floodplain. Um, and this floodplain here is a preliminary map that FEMA has released. It's not yet jurisdictional, um, but something that we know on every project, we always have to be forward look thinking, you know, because FEMA is constantly revising their maps. Um, good news is it's less restrictive around your existing building. I'll toggle back for a second. You can see the existing building technically is in the floodplain, but now it, when, it, when this new plat plan is adopted, it won't be. Um, it more accurately follows the topography of the site, and that's typically what hap happens with those maps. Um, but the rest of the floodplains that are expanding are um, generally doing that within already restricted areas of wetlands, so it doesn't look like it's going to be any detriment to developability. So as far as circulation is concerned, we've recognized that Cambridge Street is a primary thoroughfare from 95 all the way up to 3A, and it's also the singular entrance to the site for all of your car and bus traffic at that signalized intersection by the stadium. Um, and we also have other points of connection, uh, emergency access from the south and from the east off of Arlington Road, 
Um, we also have um, pedestrian connections at, at those locations um, as well and other points by uh, Anna Road and, and over to the west. Um, but, you know, that major site driveway, I think, is one of the um, key criteria that we have to work with on this. Um, so with that said, um, we're looking at these two areas, uh, we're saying buildable areas. The stadium has um, some major constraints, the topography to the southeast, the fact that, you know, a couple of years ago, you've spent a uh, million dollars just resurfacing and returfing that. Um, and to relocate that would be a very significant expense and probably disadvantageous from a political standpoint. So we're really going to, for today anyway, focus on this central buildable area for any new uh, building ideas. Um, and then, of course, an addition renovation that would be tied to the existing building. Um, and Charlie's going to be talking about that next. But one of the things I wanted to point out as I'm uh, turning it over to Charlie is um, I really admire the fact that he is always focused on keeping clients happy. You know, and um, we've been working together for 20 years or so. And it's that positive working relationship that we've developed with TAPE and the communities that we serve that makes these projects meaningful to us. So I'll turn this over to Charlie. Thanks, David. We'll continue the musical chairs. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 so you had asked about um, you know phased construction. You'd asked about construction on the site. You'd talk, uh, and we're going to try to briefly talk about within the, that about within the context of this site. And as David, you already know all about how complicated this site is. We've learned a little bit about how complicated this site is, and it's very constrained. However, we took a couple of our projects and, and put them down uh, on the site to see if they would fit. And this first image is Sharon High School, which is just a little bit larger than you in terms of population, or very similar. It's a two-story um, building. Your building, of course, is, um, is, is mostly one story, a little bit of two-story. So we think there is the possibility of a replacement um, building uh, next to the existing building. And that's certainly one of the strategies, right? A replacement building next to a building uh, that, you, that you occupy. Of course, the challenges are around construction, lay down space, circulation, student safety, and the like. Uh, but it would be one of the things we'd explore. Another one, this is the Woburn High School. And this is a bit larger uh, in population, but a lot of you may know that building because you're in the same league, I believe. And um, it's a four-story building, right? So it really makes a difference how tall you are as well. But that might also, uh, as a hypothetical fit, test fit, it might work. What you're not going to see from us tonight is big fancy renderings of a proposed building. We really feel like the design process involves you. Ultimately, it's your building. It's your community. And we really would prefer to enter into this process with you and with your guidance and with your input. Um, so what we're looking at here are buildings we've already done. And all our buildings tend to be different. If you look through our portfolio, we don't do the, you know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a single style. It is a, um, it, they're unique. They reflect their communities. And we really try to, to kind of embody what you want to, to see happen. So you won't see fancy renderings tonight from us of, uh, of, of proposed buildings, but you will see these diagrams. And then this diagram shows an addition and a renovation to half of the high school and removal of part of the high school. And the nice thing about this option is we potentially could keep your auditorium and your gym, but we could potentially add you know, an academic wing and relocate some of the functions that are to the, to the southeast um, over to a new addition. But it would allow us to build the addition first, move students into it, and then possibly leave one half of the building while we renovate a half of the building and then take down the other half of the building and move students back into that renovated part. So there's a strategy there that could work. So what does this all mean? It means there are a number of phasing approaches. There's the we'll just renovate approach. We have occupied, this is Nor which is considerably smaller than you, but Norwell High School, six phases. What does this mean? It means kids are hopping all over the place. It means they're constantly um, uh, under duress from construction, and it means the construction duration is lengthy. But it can be done. And this was a concrete, brutalist building. Um, I, is it okay if we ask questions in the middle? It is. Okay. Um, I'm interested in knowing how long that process was. 
I cannot remember the precise duration, but I know it was something, I think three years maybe? Three years. And if, if we did one of those other versions that you were showing us. I wonder, I wonder if it two? wouldn't be 18 months 18 to two months. years. I mean, 18 months is aggressive, okay. in fairness. It also depends on which one you pick and, uh, and whether there's carry on uh, site work and these kind of things. So you have to, and we're really interested, it's a topic that interests me because when we go into these studies, these are real cost drivers. Mm -hmm. It isn't just, oh, we can do this really neat building. It's, ha ha you know, what is the cost of the, the you know, time is money. So duration is meaningful, uh, as is, um, as is uh, uh, you know, how it's thought through. And we like to think about those things early. So Another one is sort of. If, if, and so the longer the construction time with more phases yeah. costs more generally. It does. Okay. It and does. I understand there's lots of multiple factors. So no, but that absolutely. Duration is meaningful. Um, uh, time is money is the great saying, right? Um, another option would be to do, we did a middle school in Wakefield, not too far from here, where we built about two-thirds of a new building and, and took down about a third of an existing building. And then we <laughs> relocated students into the new part, took down the rest of the old part, and built the rest of the new part. So it was basically two, two demolition phases, two construction phases. But it's sort of partial as you go along. And then there's the let's get temporary space off-site somewhere, the swing space uh, um, option. Problem with the swing space option is you're spending a whole lot of money on a capital investment that you can't recover. You're essentially renting, leasing, uh, space, either permanent space somewhere from some neighbor or uh, modular units. It is not generally, we're doing it right now in um, Winchester, which is also not far from here, um, for an elementary school, but it is, uh, it is not necessarily the best uh, bang for the taxpayer dollars. And then the f tried and true option is build a new building next to the old building and then occupy the new building and take the old building down. So it's the leapfrog approach. And if you look at that diagram in the lower left corner, you'll see purple is existing, green is new. And in the right hand side, you'll see the photograph of that actually underway where you have the existing building and, and right next to it, the new building. And then you have the, of course, the finished product, which as I mentioned, many of you may know. And then Sharon, which we just talked about, is a similar scenario. We built a new building next to an old building. And again, the big constraint here is do you have enough site to maintain roadways? Do you have enough site to maintain parking? Do you have enough site to uh, also add construction parking and lay down space and these kind of topics. So all of this is really important. And, but there are a series of strategies. Here's that image of the building done. Um, and we have a lot of experience doing it. And, and, and it's really, you know, it's interesting to dig into because it'll inform those options. So I'm going to hand it over to Chris, who's a wonderful communicator, and he's going to talk to you about outreach. Because again, we think it's your, your building ultimately, and, and that's what we want to kind of follow. All right. All right. So, as Charlie said, one of my uh, primary roles, in addition to uh, the design lead that I'll take, is uh, doing the community outreach and engaging with your community. Um, based on our recent experience with the Sharon High School, which you've seen, um, we engaged with numerous stakeholders, including the non educational components of community education and uh, the the local access TV. And the way we did that was we had early sessions that were sort of parallel with the visioning process. So what we did was do um, small sessions with these groups that were uh, sort of safe spaces with their constituents so they could say whatever they wanted that appealed to them. And it's our job to take those notes, listen well, and then report back to your committee and the building committee and the visioning sessions with a so cohesive narrative that uh, talks about common themes or outlier thoughts or whatever and bring those into a response that uh, really resonates with everybody. And so we do that early enough that we can get a feel of where this thing is, uh, where the, the temperature of the community is. Um, and then we try to layer that into the visioning sessions. And, and really that's my, one of my primary roles is to reach out, find those people, have those meetings, even if it's a one-on-one -on -one with someone who has big feelings. Um, we'll do that and we'll take that opportunity. Um, but one of the uh, one ways that we do this virtually uh, is by finding the story. And so 
uh, storytelling is big for us. Uh, it finds a place in time, but also a, a place in a, in a community um, to realize where the stories are. And so we've sort of developed this narrative in our, in our practice about hearing the story, be the story, and then tell the story. And that's this narrative of when we start the project, we want to hear everything there is, form the cohesive story that becomes the one that everybody lives out in the building, and then as they tell that story, it generates excitement for uh, this multi-generational aspect of the building that gets handed down from year to year. And um, really, we do that through this high-quality video stuff that we, uh, stuff, video um, documentary uh, that we do, and, um, and, and these become hallmarks of the building, and it helps our team, too, to look back on during the design process because we can, we can hear your voices um, telling us what we need to do if we uh, didn't get it in a note or something like that. Um, but all of that really is situated around the desire to build value-driven design. And the value is not only in the cost value, but the values that you bring to the project that is your community and put those into the building. And so every aspect of this is really hinging on um, that value-driven effort. And, but it doesn't stop there, right? Because you are attempting this at self-funding, and um, that is going to have its own, uh, its own set of narratives or rails that we need to revolve around. Um, but that, that communication of budget early on is important, and we don't want to propose things that ultimately you may not be able to afford or that you have to walk back when you get a, a cost estimate. Um, we need to right-size this stuff from the beginning. And, um, you know, before 2022 or 2023, when the whole world experienced this inflation problem and we, everybody was VEing and coming in over budget, TAPE really didn't have uh, those issues. Uh, uh, from the study phase all the way through the GMPs, we always had this sort of downward cycle of cost because it's known early, we find the right size project that's cost effective and suits your needs, and then we, uh, we develop that cost all the way through. The graph on the top talks about how you have the most input on design at the beginning, um, and, uh, and then it kind of goes down as you go through, so when you don't want to be caught in those um, moments of VE. And then really the success story here is all the money that comes back to towns when you do this successfully. So um, these are dollar figures that are turned back, real dollar figures, um, Sharon High School down there on the bottom, which is cut off on this screen. But the number is $6.2 million that we've turned back um, in savings. And really, this cost control chart for Lynch, which bids were open just a, about a month ago, um, 1.9 under, uh, under estimates. And what that really did was allowed us to pursue aggressively some initial value-driven design um, incentives like solar and energy efficiencies and stuff like that that really pushed into their ultimate sustainability goal that looked like they might be out of reach um, at the beginning. And so to talk to you a little bit more about those value-driven efforts um, and sustainability, I'll uh, turn it over to Jess. Good evening, everybody. Um, so what I want to talk now about is how we want to merge sustainability and systems together um, as we step through this design. And, and obviously, rolling in uh, Burlington's 2019 energy reduction plan. So we know you obviously have some plans in place wanting to reduce energy emissions, et cetera. So how do we fold all that together into this project? So it's a holistic design. We're, this is not a, again, as they've stated before, this, we're not doing this in a vacuum. We have to work with you to determine the right process, the right values that, that are specific to Burlington. So when we start studying the different options and buildings, we'll be looking at where the building's located, how it's oriented, what the building envelope looks like, what the systems within it look like, in the end to make sure they fit what you need, not what I need. I don't, you know, it's not, I'm not operating, I'm not maintaining, I want to make sure it's what you need and what you guys can take care of that fits your needs. Whether it's an addition reno, whether it's a new building, whether it's a total renovation, that process will still be the same. So I always like to look at how buildings compare to each other because I'm an engineer, so I like numbers and charts and graphs and stuff like that. And so what this chart here is showing you is how Burlington High School compares to other schools that we've benchmarked here in New England uh, with energy, what we call energy use intensity. And for those that don't know that, that's the, uh, is the energy use intensity is like the miles per gallon for a car. So the lower the number, the better, right? So Burlington's right in the middle of the pack. So 64. Not too bad, not too good. However, what you have to keep in mind is this high school is massive. So that attributes to a lot of energy. So you, you can see 22% of your 
uh, portfolio of buildings in Burlington is attributed to this one school. So obviously it's a big target. We need to be sensitive to that and make sure we do everything we can to make that better for the community. The project on the right, I'll talk a little bit more in a minute. We, in a minute, we took a, a, a school project in Connecticut that had an EUI of 72 and took it down to 18. So we'll talk a little bit, a little more about that in a minute. So the next approach we want to talk about is what are, where, are you, where do you stand in terms of emissions? What is Burlington looking for in terms of emissions reductions with this facility? Do we want to look to convert to all electric systems? Do we want to keep natural gas? Do we want something in between? And that's a community-based decision, not me. I can give you the guidance. I can give you the pros and cons of all of that stuff, which we will do. There's reasons to do things, reasons not to do things, and we'll step you all through that again, making sure that you're making the decision that's best for the community, and we'll guide you through all the steps in that, whether it's geothermal or air source heat pumps or natural gas boilers. We can do all of that, so we'll help make the work with you to make those decisions. But that all starts about really is trying to understand what's important to you. Again, I can kind of kind of say the same thing here, but it's informed decisions is really the job we have to provide you in the sustainability and system selection process. We have to then work with you. What is important? Is, is first cost the most important? Is energy efficiency the most important? Is emissions the most important? Is maintainability the most important? Whatever it is, we'll, we'll work with you and vet through all of that to come up with a similar chart. You see here the, 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 the dots on the outside are what this uh, project considered the most important. So we did a process similar to this for the town of Hopkinton, as well as Andover, and as well as Boxford. Boxford. And so, again, trying to, again, hone in on what's right for you, and that's what we'll ultimately do here. And for those that have not heard of the Inflation Reduction Act, it's a very powerful uh, piece of legislation that was introduced two, about two years ago, a year and a half ago, um, and it really changes the way we think about projects now. So the federal government has invested billions of dollars into green technologies, specifically the ones that would apply here could be ground source geothermal HVAC or in solar renewables. Those are the kind of where the big money is, is at. So what that does for you is it changes the way we look at life cycle cost analysis. How do we take that funding and, and make something good out of it? And how can we help to reduce some of the premiums that come along with sustainability? So those things will be brought to the table in terms of all the comparisons we bring to you and, and step through uh, the process. Um, one of my favorite subjects is the mass stretch code. I'm sure it's yours as well. But between me and Cesar, we'll be able to go through all of this and make sure that you guys are, we're going to make sure we do our jobs, which is what we have to do, and that we're making the right choices. Again, I can use the code to help you or use the code to hurt you. And so we don't want to hurt you with the codes. We'll make sure we make good decisions working through all of that. We're, we're, we're very well uh, versed in all of those changes, um, and we'll make sure that we're, we're all good to go there. So don't worry about the mass stretch code. And then indoor air quality. In a school environment, indoor air quality is known to have a direct correlation to student performance. I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer, so we have to make sure in any system selection we do, in any energy efficiency study we do, that we are taking care of the students that are in the building and make sure they have good indoor air quality. And that's not just air, it's also light. Like this room here, we have no access to natural light. It's probably not the most engaging of places, so we have to look and study the building and see how we are bringing natural light into the spaces as well as making sure indoor air quality is where it needs to be. And then lessons learned. We've, you know, again, we've done this a million times, and I've got a lot of projects I've done. And I, what, I guess what I'm, the takeaway from a lesson learned here is that we have to get your buy-in on what the systems want to be. We really have to work with you to determine what's best for you, how simple it needs to be, how smart the systems want to be. We can make things as complicated as we want or as simple as we want. So, again, it's a balancing act that's, that's fine-tuned to what you want. But one thing, I, the big takeaway here that I think is important is measurement and verification of how buildings perform is critical. So I can design whatever all day long, but if it doesn't perform, then I haven't done my job. So we will go back. That's what these, again, graphs and charts are my specialty. So we, we verified, this was the uh, verified and measured how the buildings performed based on the systems we put in. So I can't tell you the critical part of that. Having you engaged at the beginning, we can start training your people during design of the systems. We can go look at buildings we've designed to make sure, again, that you're, you know what you're getting before the systems are built. There's a lot to, a lot to that, and it's a very important uh, part of the process. And last but not least, um, this is the first verified K-12 public school in New England, and it's in Connecticut. Um, there are a lot of people out there saying they have zero energy schools, but this one actually is verified uh, through the National Building, uh, National Building Institute. Um, and, and while that's important to you, this is a building that was built in the 1950s, so it can be done on any building. 
but I want to I want to stress here that there was no sacrifice made to the learning environment with this project. It was all about making sure they could keep educating students in this building for the next 30, 40, 50 years and incorporating 21st century learning on top of all of the innovative energy features that were put into it. So that said, there's the third David behind me. He's going to come up here and talk about educational visioning, and then we'll be, we'll be done with the Davids for the night. So <laughs> thank you. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so visioning. Uh, visioning is where everything kind of starts, right? And it's, um, it's where we learn as much as possible about you and what you do and what you value. It's where we share lots of best practice examples of what can be done and push your thinking forward, but it's all about listening. And usually this process, um, it's always customized. We'll start by meeting with your leadership team and talk about what we can focus on, who the stakeholders uh, in our workshop should be. There's generally a series of workshops that build one upon another, but there are also smaller focus groups. Um, one key constituent that we really want to engage in this is students. Um, of course, your administrators and, and faculty and, um, and, your, and your community. But students, are, this is a wonderful learning opportunity for them, and they have lots of ideas about what they would like to see as a building of the future. And this is a process that, um, well, I have a background as I am a licensed architect, but I also spent 20 years as a, as a teacher, uh, high school teacher and curriculum developer. And so I really approach this in terms of working with educators and the community around what your vision is as a district, uh, your plan for success. We want to build on all the good work and ideas that you already have and connect that to ideas about space. This is something that I've done uh, with 19 MSBA high school projects over the last 13 years, as well as many other projects around the country, public, charter, and independent. And one thing that, um, that is really common among all these projects, of course, is that we're looking to uh, create the most cost-effective and efficient and inspiring building that will help you to support the teaching and learning that you would like to, that you envision for your community over the next 50 years, because we're talking about this as a 50-year building. I think we've got a reminder coming up here. I'm going to get that off. Chris? <laughs> Oh, it's not showing up on the screen, so that's okay. All right. And so, um, and your future ready learning goals are really going to be what serve as the lenses through which we look at what all the possibilities are. Um, so we'll really want to talk to you about how to build off of your district plan for success. Uh, we know that you're, you're focused on learning, equity, and thriving. We have lots of ideas about how space can support that. Uh, we want to learn about um, the, the programs that um, are on your cutting edge, as well as talk to you about how the building itself can really um, sort of uh, foster creativity and critical thinking by being inspiring, by promoting visible connections uh, between, between its inhabitants, uh, by helping to build a sense of community uh, within, within the school. And uh, we know that social emotional learning is something that you as many districts are focusing on as well as issues of safety and community building. And that's something that the building really can have a huge effect on in terms of how it supports um, both a sense of connection to the whole building as well as to smaller communities within it. So we'll talk about ideas about, um, about co-locating spaces in such a way that we're not using more square footage but we're doing it, we're creating synergy between between those spaces, creating a sense of community and belonging, building a, a clear sense of who's in the building. Um, and we want to also talk about enrichment spaces and how those are easily accessible and how the community might use the building after hours in safe ways. So these are all themes uh, that we'll touch upon. It's a lot about creating a common language about the design priorities that you have as connected uh, to, your, to your educational priorities. And one of the themes that um, really comes up is that of synergy and how do we get a bigger bang for the buck. Um, so 
the classroom is still going to be our basic building block and we want that classroom to be as flexible as possible with easy to manipulate modular furniture good technology we need to be large enough so that it can accommodate both traditional and non-traditional teaching project-based learning and we think of classrooms as like maker spaces but we also think about those spaces like that have more specialty kind of focus like stem or steam labs and how those support um, sort of real forward thinking and really engaging program we want to meet kids where they're at and so we want to provide the opportunity for all sorts of modalities when we think about these communities we can think about classrooms as connected to breakout rooms and teacher planning spaces and extended learning areas where we can utilize every square inch of the school so there's a lot of exciting stuff to talk about Wendy's going to talk a little bit more about interior design now. And one of the things that's that's really wonderful about Wendy is that she has had uh, a lot of experience in doing the kind of research in looking at how interior spaces really affect student behavior and performance. Thank you, Thank you David. One of the things that makes TAPE extra special is our focus on designing schools from the inside out. And we do that tailored to the individual communities. And, I, and Charlie had mentioned our portfolio work. I think that if you look at our portfolio and you look at the interiors in particular, you'll notice that they are very d diverse from each other, each project. And that's because we want to make spaces for you. As part of our design process, we merge individual programming sessions with research and precedence with a focus on function, safety, health, and wellness. Health and safety are the foundation for everything we do. We advocate for healthier, sustainable material choices by staying current with red list of toxic materials and implementing design solutions that bring occupants closer to nature by maximizing daylight, taking advantage of natural views, and providing easy access to outdoor classrooms. Additionally, we develop solutions utilizing SEPTED principles, including natural surveillance in the development of layouts and the mitigation of potential ambush points. We create distinct unmistakable entrances for different groups as a form of natural access control, and we reinforce territories or zones through changes in materiality and architectural cues. Maintenance is a critical component to crime prevention. As the better the building is maintained, the more it deters crime. For this reason, and for many others, we specify durable, durable materials with extensive warranties. As David mentioned, I bring with me 10 years of academic research in learning environments, and particularly maker spaces and active learning classrooms. Teaming up with David Stephen, we develop evidence-based design solutions utilizing concepts such as connection, transparency, and discovery. For the renovation of the Belmonte School, this is the concrete uh, building that David number one spoke of earlier, we designed a new suite of STEM classrooms. We integrated visual connections between the five rooms as a way to encourage cross-disciplinary collaborations. Standing in the makerspace classroom, which we see here, on one end, you see all the way through the other four classrooms to the science room on the other end. Ultimately, learning spaces should inspire and motivate. Along with transparency, we leverage color, light, and graphics to instill a joy for learning. We strategically position focal points, windows, and graphics to spark curiosity and encourage movement through space. While renovating the Belmonte School, we strive to breathe new life into a dark, foreboding structure. From miscellaneous areas of match, patch, and repair to mounted conduit and all the wonderful things that come with concrete walls, we had quite a patchwork, and there was lots of pivoting. But with the modest budget, we removed dark finishes, opened up spaces, added color and technology, and brought it into the 21st century. We see similar challenges with Burlington High School, but with challenges come opportunities. With that in mind, we started to think about some of those opportunities, and one, sp one space in particular really stood out to us, the upper library. 
This is an image of the upper library as it exists now. After generating some very conceptual ideas, we started to build a vision for where it could go. The stair was already a focal point, but now it's a design feature and serves as a landmark for wayfinding purposes. We've made use of the lower mezzanine and added stairs on either side, learning stairs. We've also added graphics, light, natural materials, and flexible furniture. Taking this one step further, exploring big possibilities, we wondered what would happen if we opened up the band of space adjacent to the library as a central crossroads. The library would remain the library while its common space provided more, uh, more connection points, better suited for bringing people together and hosting community functions. Utilizing this crossroads concept, we connected your two long parallel corridors, as well as various educational and non-educational program elements. The transparency between the commons and upper library provides excellent sight lines, natural surveillance, and opportunity for idea generation. And we've incorporated a balance of school colors with neutrals and furnishings, and developed wall graphics to showcase school pride and community value systems. Beyond the crossroads concept, we explored ideas for STEAM and general classrooms and what those might look like. These conceptual ideas could be new build or their ideas that could be modified to fit a renovation. The STEAM suite shown here is designed for project-based learning across disciplines with the implementation of thoughtful adjacencies, physical and visual connections, impromptu breakouts, and shared equipment. The current floor pattern extends from science to breakout through to one of the tech classrooms, visually connecting the different disciplines. The furniture is flexible, mobile, and we've maxed out writing surfaces everywhere. In this general classrooms vignette, we continue to push for natural light, access to outdoor classrooms, and visual connection between floors. Focal points and expansive views encourage movement in and through the space, and we've provided visibility between group rooms and the learning corridor for natural surveillance. Breakouts adjacent to classroom en entrances are intentionally designed to be semi-dedicated, while breakouts in the corridor are more open and diverse. Inside the classroom, we focused on flexible layouts by exploring an active learning or scale-up layout by placing interactive TVs on all sides, eliminating the singular teaching wall and providing teachers with opportunity to move around the room. All of these features are balanced with a robust and responsive FF&E approach, including adjustable height furnishings to encourage movement and participation. These are just a few thought starters that we had, but we enjoy the opportunity to explore more design and fine tune it, the solutions that work best for you and your community. All right, you've made it. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're done. I, I'll just close by saying that um, We've thrown a lot at you, and uh, we've looked at some initial ideas on renovation, addition renovation, new construction. But we also think that we want to talk to you about a potential hybrid option, which is you could build a new academic building that's slightly smaller, and then renovate this entire building and create a big community center that the high school feeds off and the community feeds off as well, and expand opportunities um, for everything. But really, regardless of whatever happens, it is your school and it's your town and our firm is here to make your vision um, come to life and that's really what our process is tailored around. Um, and so we're prepared and we're eager and we're ready to embark on the journey with you. And so um, with that, thank you for your time and we're happy to entertain any questions you might have. Uh, thank you very much, that was uh, quite good. Um, and very detailed and appreciate you going through, you know, and answering the questions we presented. I think you did a great job. Um, right now, I'll open it up for any additional questions anyone may have. Um, and I'll just go in the, the room. Just hold your hand up if you want to ask a question. Ms. Massaro. I just have a straightforward one. The, what's the project cost on the Sharon High School? Uh, Sharon had a GMP of $124 million, and it came back uh, right now. Um, that was that was the construction cost. So okay. Total project. That's how you get the six million. But okay. The the final we're sort of in closeout right now, and it's, it looks like it's about one hundred twenty one. Okay. So, in, in, uh, two hundred and forty thousand square feet. Uh, 
Simon? Um, yes, uh, you, you talked about your experience with concrete buildings. Um, so not only do we have a concrete building, but we have science labs that are buried in the middle, and we have whole wings of the school that have no windows. And so I, I, I don't know if there's a two-minute you know, response to how are you going to, how can you open up the school for the day lighting that's so important that you know and for this the lights and the windows and and you know that kind of thing so I mean even if we built a new stem wing there's still this core of the building that we would probably be wanting to use for classrooms or whatever so I, I'd just like your couple minute comment on that thank you um. Yeah. Oh, you get to hear from Cesar. Oh, you do. Hope he doesn't he start talking about Cesar codes. Cesar to be here. Um, well, uh, the, the, um, we have done many, many, many buildings. Uh, most of our uh, structures that are steel frame construction, concrete uh, slabs, things like that. Uh, the difference with uh, concrete structure is that it's difficult but not impossible to manipulate is just knowing, as what David was saying before, is this uh, uh, discovery. Uh, what is this concrete building? Was it pre-stress concrete? Was it post-tension? Uh, where are the tendons of it? Where's the structure that keeps it together? And once we know those things, and there's technology nowadays with, that allows you to find where the, the, the structural members are, you avoid them. You work with the voids. Um, for uh, utility things, you can go in between the voids. Uh, you can avoid certain type of beams. You can go, depending on the orientation of the structure, you may eliminate entire sections so that you don't disturb, you don't cut a hole into the wall. You go to the next support and rebuild back in a way that is more flexible. So yeah, they, they are, like I said, it's, it, it's difficult, it's not, uh, you saw those images with, uh, with all that um, depth in the STEM rooms. Um, yeah, it, it's doable, <laughs> not easy, but it's doable. So one of the, uh, the so another answer to the question oh, is, um, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of reference back to some experience that I know David Stephen has, but um, there's a highly successful high-tech high in uh, California and that building is um, if I'm not mistaken it's a pretty big building and has a lot of program in the middle of it but what they did was light from above and have a lot of natural like had a lot of glass that allows for both all this stuff we've talked about already the transparency between programs that ignites inspiration and, and interest and um, creativity and things like that um, but you very carefully select moments where you can light from above and then get borrowed light that spreads out. That gives you the natural light. But the thing that you really will have a hard time replicating in the middle of a building like that in those areas is uh, views to nature. And so you may see us do, um, there's one image, I think it may be in the proposal, but Sharon, we introduced a whole um, green moss wall on the inside of the building and you can see it from one end to the other and it creates opportunities to bring nature in where we can't see nature out and flood the space from above with as much daylight as we can. And from there, you know, who knows? Like we really got to get our hands on the building and start tweaking it and finding out the opportunities that lie, like Cesar said. But I think those are some strategies you might see is bring the outside in, get the, the for the view, the nature view, use natural materials, get the light in from above and then borrow light out. So vertical, horizontal, nature in, so, yeah. Anyone else? I, I did have a question uh, myself. I, I, I think you addressed it a little bit in the <laughs> initial, um, but we do have other occupants, such yeah. as BCAT, and I know that's going to um, be a challenge in addition because, uh, you know, I know we all have to make decisions on, you know, what we're doing with those um, particular groups and and how we're going to deal with that but um what 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 are your thoughts uh in terms of trying to you know if we all decide we want to keep that those are the other things we have to move around besides students right yeah um i i love that design challenge actually <laughs> so the sharon high school had 
um, their cable access TV was in a, a rented office space across town. They had this community education component that fell under the public schools, but it really is, um, you know, uh, like yoga classes and things like that, cooking classes and whatnot that are offered from the public schools. Pay, you pay money to go to them, and they had a certain amount of money to contribute to the project as well. They were excluded from MSBA reimbursement, but um, the fact is, is we had to figure out a way to tie those in to the building, create safety around, like safe barriers where you can have community enter in to a part of the building, but the students are still secure and safe. Um, and we did that with both the high school, the, both the uh, cable access studio and the community education studio. Um, and what ended up happening was uh, we found opportunities to um, cross pollinate those. So where community ed has cooking classes, the Spanish class can now come down and do a section on uh, Spanish cuisine, cuisine or French cuisine or whatever you want to do and do a cooking exposition because it's actually set up as a teaching cooking classroom that community ed uses, right? So they just don't program it at the same time, but it's all accessible, right? And so that challenge is, um, it, it can be challenging, but if you find out from all the stakeholders in advance, like what their, what their opportunities are to enrich a high school program, but then also what are the constraints that we don't need to cross in terms of a nine to five when students are in the building and, and you need the community here. Um, and really those barriers between safety and security and offering, um, offering new opportunities that you may not have right now. And that's really where this crossroads thing came up for us actually, is that um, we, we, we felt like the town is in some ways at a crossroads and you have all this stuff in this building that is crossroading together. And then you have two long corridors that could be united. And so we thought that's where this whole like creative thinking around if we can draw that out and make those things actually like a common crossroads connection, then you build uh, the community within the building that supports the community that's not in the building yet and draws them in. So that's kind of, that's kind of the, what we'll try to do, um, and it is a process, but we'll, we'll guide you there. <laughs> so. I would just add to that that we're, we're always thinking about sort of the public realm of schools and, and any building that we design now, any school now needs to be a community resource. So we're thinking about, you know, just as in a home you have your more public and private realms, you know, how do you block off whole areas of the school after hours so that those big ticket spaces that you have that are huge investments for your community really become a community resource. They can also become a resource for, for uh, generating revenue yeah. as well um, and I think about at the West Bridgewater uh, Middle High School we have cable access TV there uh, that's embedded within um, and that's a big part of their program but that it's part of a building that can com be completely blocked off as a community center from the rest of the school and it's used it's used 24 7 and that's really an approach that we would want to talk to you about anyway. Um, and when we think also about um, sort of school-run businesses or any kind of, you know, um, uh, certainly we think about it with Chapter 74 programming in comprehensive high schools, um, we want to have that public face that feels safe um, to access. Thank you. Um, I do have some questions uh, that people emailed me. So I wanted to try, I, I believe, uh, actually, uh, Chris Campbell had a few, but I think you addressed them in your presentation, so I'm not going to ask his questions. Um, I, uh, Mimi uh, Bix Highland had a couple questions. I'm going to um, pick a couple of them here. Um, she asked the question, is your firm woman owned? Our firm is not women owned, but we are, <laughs> we're, about 51, about 51 percent women staffed, okay. and so that's a big, you know, we're we're pursuing that and. Okay. Um, yeah. And then, what percent of your staff are service disabled veterans? I don't believe we have any service disabled <laughs> veterans right now. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, do you have a percent for staff of people of color? Um, I would have to get back to you on that. We do okay. have. Um, we report all that to the state. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know the recent, the most yeah. recent calculation for this. I just want to be fair and ask all the questions that yeah. people ask me to ask. Sure. Um, anybody else online? And then we've got to pretty much wrap this up because we're getting close to that hour. Catherine, can uh, I just any hands up? Ask yes, go ahead. Two questions. Um, so two questions. Um, 
One, um, you put up the slide uh, demonstrating resources and who's available for the team. Just want to clarify that in terms of how, how many of the, you have 10 projects in total, you got $400 million of work going on right now. How much of that is in design and how much of it is in construction administration? And then um, secondly, we put some milestone dates on you know, a preliminary schedule to doing this work. Would love to get your 30 second thoughts um, on uh, what you feel like the, the feasibility study stage is going to take in terms of timing. Let me do it this way. Recognizing that you have about a minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, rush. no rush. Okay, so um, l let me just say it this way: is that um, on this graph, uh, everything is everything's in CA right now. Uh, CA are bidding on our on our project workload. Um, we have Millis Middle High School, which is um, it, it's just starting up a feasibility, but it's probably a it, all intents and purposes right now. It's going to be a renovation project that's about. Um, probably 40 to 50 million and then um, and that's an MSBA job right that is an MSBA that. project yep um, and then Walpole High School is um, gonna be out to bid by July so okay. um, of the firm's capacity uh, we really are really light on DD uh, um, on design work right now um, compared to what we can achieve and then um, the schedule, uh, I think that in, in reality, like most of these things um, happen fairly quickly. And so I think once we get into um, the lockstep with with the OPM and the district, um, we're going to hit your schedule. Like that's just, we don't go into these things and um, start to assume other things. And, you know, Doran Whittier is a great firm and they know how to make schedules. And so we, we trust that. Um, you've analyzed things appropriately, um, and at this phase, I don't know that we can comment super in depth on that because we don't have all the the components that you have. Um, but from a quick view of it on what we do know, I think it's I think it's totally achievable. And, and um, trust me, as soon as we know, we'll we'll chime up and say that might be take a little bit longer or not, or we can do it faster. So, um, yeah. Thank you. And. I don't see, do you see any hands up? Okay, good. So thank you very much. Uh, we definitely appreciate your time and all of you coming. <laughs> and uh, oh, I'm sorry, who had their hand up? Oh, okay, Jeremy. We just uh, quickly, please, because we've got to move on. Okay. Just, uh, just a few, give it a 30 second um, blurb on what your firm's approach is, is adding feature proof uh, features to the building that allow technological upgrades to both infrastructure and educational program because uh, this is a 50 year plus investment for the community. <laughs> okay, um, so future proofing is the question, right? So, so um, uh, and I heard future proofing relative to technology as well, but um, uh, so concrete buildings can produce a challenge with uh, technology running over Wi Fi um, sometimes, and so we want to make sure we calculate all of that, create your heat maps appropriately. Um, but really, um, the, the future proofing is hard because like we, we have this conversation a lot with clients and um, 20 years from now, who knows what technology is going to be out there that we don't know about today. Um, but we do have the ability to hone in on um, the experts that we have around us. And the thing that we say a lot in our firm is we have to make the absolute best decisions with the information we have in front of us right now today. Um, and that will guide our approach to guiding you on what things we can put in that may not be um, things that disappear in the future. Um, so conduits might always be needed in some way somehow. And so we can designate different ways to do that to pull technology or not. Um, but I think that there's that's a whole robust conversation, but I think the short answer is um, we need to do the research, show you the horizon, and t may all make a collective decision with the best information we have right now, and um, and then who knows what the future brings. So, all right, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>
All right, we're good. Apologies for the uh, delay, everyone. We had some technological problems. Um, I would like to uh, welcome the Jonathan Levy Architects DLR Group to do their presentation. Um, I'm Chair Catherine Bond. This is uh, Martha Simon, Vice Chair. I assume you'll be introducing yourselves at some point during your presentation or along the presentation. So let's go ahead and get this started since we're a little bit late. You will have an hour, as we mentioned. So. Please well, proceed. Thank, thank you for that courtesy. It's a pleasure to be with you here tonight. I'd like to start on a brief personal note because I do have a connection to Burlington. I, I, I actually grew up in Newton nearby, um, but a close family, very close family member I taught here for many years in your math department uh, in the 60s and early 70s. I don't know if there's anyone here old enough to have uh, had him as a as an instructor. His name was Peter Pars. And uh, he loved this community, and the community loved him as well. Pars, P A R S, yeah. yeah. And he, he's still in your yearbooks, and, you know, he's, <laughs> but I remember many occasions where he spoke fondly of your community. So uh, it's good to be here and to have that connection. So, with that, uh, I'd like to move. Can I move to the PowerPoint now? Uh, you're, everyone has seen us, and I think you can see. So, and I, I just want to just remind everyone to get as close to the mic as possible, so the people who are listening online can hear. Thank you. How's that? It's not in presentation mode. It's your mode. preview. It's it your is preview. on here. So s maybe switch your screen? I think it's good. Okay, it's just not showing it up there. So it's showing presentation mode there, right? Or it's, it's showing the screen, the uh -huh. side slides? I am. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me try it one more time. Sidebar's not on his screen. Doesn't change it. Oh, there, there we go. go. Okay, third time's a chart. <laughs> so we've divided our presentation into uh, five critical parts, but I want to make sure that we get to the fun part, which is we're going to have some interactivity today. We're going to do two activities, um, and I want to make sure that we cover all of your questions. So in doing that, we've actually labeled all of our slides with the questions that are uh, appropriate to that slide and as well as, the, as well as the sections. So I think the first thing I want to tell you is uh, why we've come together. So Jonathan Levy Architects is a firm that's been in business now for many, many years. Uh, we're based in, uh, in Boston. Uh, we've come together with the DLR group now uh, on two important projects where we've developed a really fluent and wonderful uh, collaboration. Um, <laughs> Jana and I have worked together very, very closely. Jana lives right here in Sudbury. Uh, I live in Brookline. Uh, we're working on the Boston Master Plan now, which is a project to uh, orient the city of Boston to its 10-year future, uh, studying all 120 of its uh, school sites and designing 12 model schools uh, that are concept case studies for them to uh, refer to over the years. Architects will be referring to these for years and years, including the design guidelines and every aspect of what makes a great school for uh, Boston's kids. And we're also uh, building a new high school in Pawtucket Rhode Island, which is going to replace, for those of you who are baseball fans, it's going to replace the old Pawsock Stadium uh, in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Uh, that's, that's a 2,100 student uh, high school. Um, so um, why do we come together? Because JLA is an accustomed Massachusetts school builder. Uh, we've built quite a few projects in Massachusetts with the public schools uh, system, and most of them M MSBA projects. Uh, we also have a reputation for design uh, excellence, so 
our role in this project will be as director of design and lead architect, and, and DLR will be contributing their really enormous wealth of evidence-based research, their depth of resources with 1,400 employees all around the country that we can draw on as we need them, and experts like two that we have here tonight with us today, Pam and, and, and Marilyn. So that's why uh, JLA and DLR have come together. And uh, I think we make an incredible team. We have the best of both worlds. We have your local. Um, uh, you get me. I, I <laughs> will be here with you at every meeting. Uh, and you get uh, the, the enormous depth of resources of a company like DLR. So with that, I'm going to turn it uh, to uh, our folks to tell you who they are and what excites them about uh, our work in school design. So I'm Jana Silsby. I'm with DLR Group. And as he said, I'm local here. My entire career has been in the Massachusetts Boston area. And what gets me up every day is when I open a school with a community and you see those kids doing cartwheels on the stage and squealing with delight and they're just so excited to be there. That's really what like makes it all happen. I am passionate about sustainability. I've been doing it before it was cool. Um, and you'll hear more about that That's later. That's true. Uh, I forgot to mention, I, my, I'm Jonathan Levy, obviously. Uh, this is my 50th anniversary as an architect uh, this year. And um, I have to say that among all the project types that I've been uh, involved with, and many of them quite large and uh, all over the world, Schools are by far the most important. I have five children of my own, and uh, schools, I think, are the most impactful. I'm Philip Gray. Uh, I'm a principal with Jonathan, and I'm a project manager for this project. And I can't imagine a building type that could have more of an impact not only on the kids but also on the community because it affects the parents as well. So that is what... I find so exciting about schools. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Shumway. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer and also the president of RFS Engineering. We'll be handling the mechanical and electrical engineering for the project. Uh, Jana and I have worked together for over 10 years. Uh, what I really like about my project and my, and my, prop, my job in my uh, 35th year with RFS is that I'm still learning. Every, every project is, uh, there's something new. And um, to do that in an educational environment um, is, is pretty neat. And I'm Elizabeth Bugby. I would be the building systems coordinator. And uh, I just love being out in the construction field, um, helping thread the needle with all the MEP systems. I'm Pam Leffelman. I'm a senior principal with DLR Group. And I do believe architecture can enable teaching and learning. And the biggest impact is at the beginning of the process in making sure that the program and adjacencies and components are really thought about in such a way that they're supporting your aspirations and goals. And I'm Marilyn Dennison. I'm the unicorn of the team. <laughs> I'm a career educator. I spent 25 years in K-12 education from teacher to assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction and all the roles in between, all the different hats. Um, I am now DLR Group's teaching and learning designer and my role will be to work with your stakeholders and vision for the future. What is the teaching and learning in the spaces that are gonna help you do your job the best? Super excited to be here. And I'm Bill Lavallo, managing principal with La Measure Consultants. We're the structural engineering group. Uh, for this team and working with uh, Jonathan his team for over 10 years creating spaces these spaces excite me uh, the spaces of high school that change a community uh, larger space and I can also tell you for the past 10 years I've been sitting in your seats uh, with my community just finishing up a 2200 student uh, middle and high school uh, in Belmont been, in Belmont it's yeah, been fascinating uh, Bill's chairman of this building committee there so I'm going to turn it now to Philip, and Philip's going to tell you about our capacity. All right. So you'll see in the upper right of all the slides what question uh, the, the slides are, are going to be addressing. But um, there was a question about our capacity and, and our readiness, and the timing really is perfect. Uh, we have had about three, we've had three schools with about 2,500 kids uh, just recently getting certificates of occupancy. So the timing is perfect for for uh, this project and as you can see in the next slide Oops. that that means that you we can 
definitively say you'll have four principals, all local, all devoted to this project. And so with that, I'll... I'll uh, let's talk about community co-creation, Phil. Yeah, so... I know it's one of the most important things to all of us here in the room mm -hmm. today. So I could go into a list of all the schools where we have done community co-creation, but really what I think I'll focus in on is the results. So as you can see on this slide, we've for 17 years, we've been working to get to yes with communities as varied as Framingham, Westport, and Weston. And every time, we've gotten a positive yes vote the first time out of the box. And we would expect to be able to do the same for Burlington. Now, I know this slide is a little complicated, but it speaks to a process. It speaks to how, what can you expect when you're working with us, and we plan ahead. So there are so many stakeholders that have an important contribution to a project like this. So what we do is we make a schedule of the milestones, and then we plan out when are we going to be meeting with all of these different stakeholders, as, as diverse as parent communities and the transportation board and Parks and Rec and everybody else. And so you will know when we're going to be having these meetings and what the agenda is going to be. And then I'm going to hand it off to Jana to talk about what we do with that information. So when we plan for these meetings, we have to know more than just when they are and who we expect to show up. We actually need to know also what we want to get out of them. And the um, type of meeting that we actually hold or the type of engagement or the type of information actually is geared towards that. So this is actually from the um, International um, Association for Public Partner, uh, pu Public Participation, sorry about that. Um, and the first one is Inform, and that's where you're just providing things like social media posts or pamphlets or the website, and it's just things where we're trying to get people informed and we're trying to prevent, pr propose that stuff in a very clear and concise way so they understand. The next level is actually consulting, and that's where you are actually wanting to get feedback. Um, you actually maybe be doing surveys or you'll have town halls or other kinds of interactions and you'll be doing like augmented reality for instance where they can actually see different proposals here on site and what it would look like and they can give you feedback by voting. Oh, we like that one or we like that one and giving comments. The next one is to actually in, um, involve them in a more um, in-depth way through like listening sessions. These are actually small group conversations in Boston for the ma uh, master plan we actually did. 23 engagements with over 550 small group conversations. That was in groups of like six to 10. And we actually took all the information and then we coded it according to the topic and we did data analysis so that we could identify, well, what are the top things that rise to the, to the top of their priority list? What do the community really care about? And so we were able to dive super deep and really then put out a survey so that they could even then rank those um, top things. We even look at it from demographics and everything like that. Then the next level actually was getting into even more detail with working with you as a steering committee and involvement as well as in the last one is charrettes where you're actually having decision making. All of this then informs the criteria that we will bring to you with different at different levels, different matrix. This one actually is looking at different options and it's a very clearly you can see then, okay, well, which option is the best? And we will constantly try to be giving you that data and that information in a way that you can understand, but also have then an objective way to make decisions um, and involving the community and even understanding what they need most and desire most from this project. Because the most powerful way to involve a community is to actually incorporate an idea in a way that's very tangible to them into the project. That's what happened in our Westport High School. People asked for a walking track and they thought that that was such an important intergenerational connector. So we found a way to bring that into the project even though the project was budget challenged. Uh, we brought that walking track in and it really garnered a lot of support among the older people in that community. It was very important. And you've heard about stakeholder engagement already, but this is really important in order to bring the people together, have the deep conversations in order to vision for the future and, and develop that North Star, where do you want to go? And then build consensus. So the, uh, these interactive activities we like to do, not just with our district administration, our educators, but our learners. You know, if we talk to our students, they will tell us. So we like to work with them and get their voice as well. An example of our interactive activities 
Uh, we have different um, engaging games that we like to play just to bring out the conversation but also lead the direction that we're going to go. I'm going to give you an example today because, you know, I am the educator, so we have to have some engagement. We have a set of cards. We call these learning connection cards. And this is really to bring out the conversations of what, do we, what kind of learning do we want to see in our building. So for kind of planning inside out, what, how should they function on the inside so we could design right uh, to, you know, encompass all of it. So in a moment, I'm going to have my colleagues pass out some uh, cards. You're going to think to the future of this school's already open and it's just beautiful. It's perfect. There are no barriers. Everything's working perfect. If we came through, what kind of learning would we see? What kind of teaching would we see? And maybe what kind of spaces we can see? Now, the way we're going to play it tonight is not the way we usually play this. But Jenna, if you'll pass out the cards, I'd like you three to work together. And this is a collaboration, so you have to kind of work together. Pick one card of learning that you think we might see. There are descriptions on the back. You four, if you'll work together on teaching. So Pam's going to pass those out. OK, those three. <laughs> and you four work on, just pick one card for what kind of space would you think you would see? And if you need descriptions, they're on the back. All right, pick one card, one card in five, four, three, two. One, okay, everybody should have their card. All right, learning. Did you get yours teaching? One second. <laughs> well, we gotta, gotta go in order. Le learning, what did you pick? Okay, authentic real world learning. That's the kind of learning we're going to see in this facility. Inquiry With basis. the teachers are going to be teaching inquiry to get to that in, uh, authentic real world learning. What kind of spaces? We picked spaces for creative work slash maker spaces. Okay, so yes. you can see how those spaces have to support an inquiry based learning or teaching with the authentic real world learning the space has to support that or you can't get to those components of the learning cycle that's so important now we you know it's much more in depth as we play this but then we also have activities that not just talk about the teaching and learning but talk about as the facility as a whole how is it going to respond to the community this is called values valuing the architecture through the lens of the user experience and sustainability and you're going to hear a little bit more about sustainability, but the cards on the right-hand side of the slide are from the values deck. And in Austin ISD, we were doing uh, this, this activity, and they had a school that was really losing a lot of students to private schools, and they really wanted to change their identity. So they chose a card that would help them build the principles in the North Star of culture and identity. They also wanted to make sure they really wrapped that community around that school and used the, the, the school as a community connector. And then they also picked health and well-being. We all know the importance of that, especially coming out of uh, COVID. But those were the cards that really helped set their path as well. So these interactive activities really help us set some priorities and develop that vision for the future. Good. Well, thank you, Marilyn. So let's talk about high schools that inspire. Pam, yeah. why don't you be our leader? Awesome. We accept. I know Marilyn is okay. passionate I, this about is, talking about this. This is my favorite slide. Thank you, Pam, for tossing <laughs> it back. So we know what impacts the learning for students the most, and it's the learner. It's the student. Their passions, their interests, their previous experiences, the way they like to learn, they have the greatest impact on their learning. But the teachers are the most important person in that room because they can, they're going to change that learning by 30%. They have the 30% impact on learning. But did you know? The physical learning environment has 16% impact on learning outcomes. This is new research that we didn't used to have when I stood in front of my board and said, we're going to change our school environments. The learning environment is really important. It could either help teaching and learning or, or it could hinder. So we always want to make sure we're going the right direction. So now Pam is going to take us that direction. There we go. <laughs> Great handoff, Marilyn. <laughs> So um, I've, I guess I, I thought I was short enough to do this. but um, so. 
Uh, I'm really proud of recently uh, DLR Group did g win the McConnell Award for Canyon View High School. Why is that important? It's important because it reflects selection by educators and planners. Um, and that's really what it's about. That started eight years ago. As part of that um, conversation, we really developed multiple tools and research. And who doesn't love four by four cards? It, if you have a card in your hand, you can say things you can't say if you don't have a four by four card in your hand. So the three things that we really developed throughout the Canyon View process was the student engagement and teacher engagement index. There are actually 10 components based on the survey of 7,000 students and 700 teachers that really contribute to architecture that enables. So this is a powerful set of uh, guidelines that help us design better buildings for you. The second thing is we developed, because who doesn't love an acronym, FINS which is flexibility and operability, individualization, nature and naturalness, and stimulation. It really augments and is an overlayer of those 10 components. And then the last thing is, and thanks to Marilyn, who's helped us with all of this bold, which is bridging organization, learning, and design. When you think about Chris and building systems, of course you commission them. Same thing with teaching and learning. How do you think about campus activation? in terms of a new building or a renovated building that really allows um, teachers to feel comfortable and really get the best benefit from that building. So even though I'm really proud of Canyon View, if we look at the next example, um, Agua Fria um, District in Arizona um, had a 50-year-old high school, and you can see the black and white slides on the left was the existing conditions. This was a phased renovation that really um, sought after the same goals that Canyon View was. And I've got to say, in my mind, it's almost better. Thank you. <coughs> so let's give it to Philip to talk a little bit about SPED. So important. Right. So um, I am the proud father of two wonderful children who are on the special, in special education. They, uh, they both have uh, autism and one high functioning and one low functioning. So I have spent the last 20 years experiencing classrooms that speak to special needs and those that don't. And so I can guarantee you that for me, as the project manager, you will also have an advocate for special needs kids. And we do that in many different ways, but throughout the design process, I will be there every step to advocate for those kids, no matter what their mental or physical abilities will be. And that means creating spaces that are the same as other kids have, so that there's no stigma going into a special classroom, for example, but also respecting privacy when that's appropriate. I understand this from a personal perspective, and it is personal to me that I would like to bring to Burlington as well. Thank you, Phil. So let's just talk about some of the special spaces that lead to 21st century education, some of them alluded to by Pam and Marilyn. Um, outdoor learning. We live in a beautiful community here in Burlington uh, with great outdoor resources. We want to bring some of that into the heart of the school. So creating buildings that actually make for natural places for students to be outdoors, to have outdoor classrooms, as we call them. Also, making cafeterias, which we spend a lot of money to build, into places where learning can occur. And how does that happen? It happens by centralizing ca cafeterias rather than, as many architects do, peripheralizing them on the outside. So making a cafeteria that's at the center of the school so that it can be used all day long, not just during the lunch periods. Using corridors, which uh, architects call the gross area of schools, as true education spaces. Making sure that every square foot that you're building and paying for is being harnessed to the project of teaching, teaching and learning. These are two examples from our uh, recent projects. And finally, making places where students want to be. 100% daylit, flooded with light, exciting kinds of spaces with shapes that excite them, where they want to go. These are places um, in our most recent school, the, the Fuller, Fuller School in Framingham, 
where kids are clamoring to get into those spaces. They want to be there. They're breakout spaces and, and spaces for a special project-based learning. So with that, we're going to talk more about the nuts and bolts of how we do all of this, how we bring this excellence to, to Burlington. So we, we've talked about design excellence. Now, how do we do that on schedule and on budget? That's what we're really interested in finding out. Philip. So again, rather than talking project by project, I just want to talk about the results. Every one of our schools has been on time and on or under budget with low change orders. This is part of our culture, and this is what we expect of ourselves for every project. And this, this slide I know is a little complicated, but we were asked to, asked to show it. This is from the MSBA website, and every one of those dots is a school, and the further left they are, the more cost-effective they are. And the green square uh, on, the, on the middle left is the Westport School, which has the lowest cost per square foot of any of the schools built in Massachusetts in the last five years. We know High school how or to do elementary that. school. High school. So JLA knows how to make a cost-effective building and bring it in on time and on budget. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Elizabeth to talk a little bit about how, how we, we do, do it. that. Yeah. Yeah, so how do we do it? Um, so how do we make the most cost-effective building? Uh, for, for our Westport job, I would like to just share some of our strategies. So this is a uh, typical classroom. Uh, we, we are able to reduce the floor-to-floor -floor heights. Um, by compacting all of the MEP systems to the back of the classroom. Uh, at the back of this image, you can see the casework along the exterior wall. Uh, we utilize manufacturers, uh, standard products, as opposed to custom uh, millwork built-in pieces. Uh, we spend a lot of time organizing the structural system so that we can expose it and reduce finishes. Uh, we're, we use simple light fixtures that just sit in um, on shelves, easy to maintain. Um, next. Uh, the egress uh, stairs, we are able to uh, expand them so that they can become the common space. Uh, we utilize uh, storefront systems as opposed to a uh, more expensive curtain wall to allow the light to come back into the space. This is an auditorium uh, at Westport. Again, simple materials. We, we expose the structural bearing walls uh, as the finish, uh, very durable, and the panels on the top function acoustically as well. And I'll move Thank you, Elizabeth. In a moment, we're going to explore your site. And one thing that we know about it, as large as it is and as long as it is, it's almost half a mile long. Uh, there's not a lot of space there, surprisingly. Uh, that's because of the encumbrances that are being uh, presented by your wetlands and various other things, which we'll talk about in a minute. So we have a lot of experience with very tight sites. On the left, you can see our Fuller School in Framingham, which was built within 20 feet of an operating school. Uh, it also was built within 15 feet of another operating school on the other mm -hmm. side of it and another school in front of it. So that was a very, very tight site. Uh, the Dearborn School, high school in, uh, in Boston, the first uh, s new school that the city had built in 17 years was built on its own footprint, including the laydown space. So we know how to build on very tight sites and to work around uh, the requirements of neighborhoods, but also of uh, severe site constraints. Also, uh, renovating op occupied buildings. So one of the uh, options, uh, one of the ideas that has has excited us is the idea of renovating this existing 1971 building. Um, it's a very robust structure, and uh, there's opportunities. Uh, there's huge accessibility challenges, but there's also opportunities. So um, how do we do that? Uh, I wanted to get, show you this example from our recent work. Um, on the left is the Burlington High School, 350,000 square feet. 1,000 occupants, maybe during the construction. On the right is our federal office building that we completed about 10 years ago. That's a 400,000 square foot building. It was completed in, in three phases. 
and Chris knows how difficult that is to do. Uh, we did it by creating uh, actual partitions, building walls between the occupied phases. Each phase had its own construction documents, including. Yeah, I would just say phased owner occupancy is, um, we do a lot of it, and it's what some of the most important things to focus on. Uh, the most important thing to focus on is safety. Uh, safety trumps everything, with especially with 1,000 people in a building. That's egress, egress paths, sprinkler systems, fire alarm systems, making sure all those systems are live throughout each and every phase. Uh, next is regular building operations, just making sure that the, that the building can carry on business as usual with all of its head-end systems and that we, an area that gets demolished in the first phase can't have all of the electrical systems or the building goes down. Uh, and then the, the, the third thing uh, that Jonathan referred to is, is documents. And uh, the documents have to be prepared in a way that are strategic and that are also appropriate for Massachusetts public bidding. Very good. So uh, you asked about flexibility. I love this question. Uh, I'll tell you why. It's something people always talk about, but no one kind of really knows what it means, flexibility. I want to tell you what it means. There are four types of flexibility and four ways that we've addressed flexibility in our projects. Uh, the first one is day-to-day -day operation. So JLA has helped pioneer the idea of teacher uh, offices between classrooms so that the teacher has a place that th is their own. And that place is not necessarily the classroom, so that the classroom can be used flexibly for other purposes. Other teachers can come and go without disrupting uh, the work of the teacher whose desk is no longer in the classroom. That's day to day. Uh, we, year to year, uh, how often is it that we have the problem of cohorts expanding and contracting uh, during a year and having to add or subtract classrooms from that cohort? That's tough when you have dead-end corridors. Uh, so one thing that we've helped uh, districts understand is how to make circular um, circulation systems so that the cohorts can ebb and flow without uh, ending up having to be have a, a single classroom displaced to another floor or displaced to another wing. You can see that on the right with our field school in Weston. Modes of operation, uh, flexibility for modes of operation. A school has to be purpose designed in order to allow for the great community welcoming activities that are going to occur there. So that means that intrinsic to the original idea of how to make a floor plan, you have to be thinking of multiple modes of flexibility. In the Westport school that we've been referring to, the whole center section of the school could be bulkheaded off from the academic portions of the school so that the community could enter from either end. They could use the gym, they could use the cafeteria, they could use the media center without interfering with the security of the academic wings on either side. And then one more very technical but very important uh, idea is the long-term viability of your school. The school's been here for 50 years. Uh, how did it adapt over those years to changing needs? The way that we do plan for that at JLA is we use the typical classroom bay as the unit of modular unit of design so that when we design small rooms, those small rooms are always within the typical class classroom bay so that in the future, if you need another classroom, you can take those partitions away and you have a classroom. So uh, that's a, a, a rigor and a discipline that we apply in view of the 50 to 100 year uh, lifespan of our, of our buildings. So with that, let's talk about sustainability. So the new stretch code and the new opt-in code and the MSB policy was your question five. Um, Chris and I and other members of the team have been de designing net zero buildings for over 15 years. So in essence, we've been designing buildings that could meet that code before the code even came out. And I will tell you that I am obsessive about the exterior wall details and thermal bridging and all of those things that impact the Teddy modeling. And you may have been doing the Teddy modeling. You've actually been working with one of our team members, um, Ali Menchaka from Airlit Studio is actually doing the Fox Hill modeling. She is an expert in the industry on Teddy modeling. So we've got you covered when it comes to the, to the net zero code. But we've also do high performing buildings. Um, I have the second highest um, scoring school for LEED in the world. When it came out, um, it got 89 points, including all of those 
um, energy and atmosphere points, but also the health and well-being points, the healthy materials points. We can do it. That project was right in the middle of the average construction. So we've got you covered. So I want to just, before we get, dive into these four steps that Chris is going to talk you through, I want to cover just one little bit of step one. Step one of getting it to a sustainable, net zero, high performing building. It is often overlooked, but it is optimizing your building program. The least expensive and most efficient space is the space that you don't have to build. We actually will be working with you in your programming. We have a special tool that connects your course schedule to the space and to the utilization of that space. You would not believe the swing in square footage that, is that can happen just by the different choices that you make. And we can show you in real time the differences in that in your choices so that you are right sizing your building. You're not building too much, you're not building too little. We'll be looking at your ancillary spaces as well, including them in that programming exercise, and also designing them so that they can change in the future. If mm -hmm. you decide later that you need more space, you could always take over that space. Mm -hmm. So I'll turn it over now to Chris to, to cover those four steps. Thanks, Jenna. Yeah, this slide, I, I realize, is difficult to read on these monitors, but it's, it's the whole intent of this is to sort of demystify sustainability, and it's, it's to break it down into four really simple steps where we drive down the loads. That's what Jana really just talked about, and there's some uh, building system, active system strategies that we would employ as well. Uh, maximizing, maximizing efficiencies, um, uh, all of today's systems with the uh, new energy code are really zero on-site carbon, uh, heat pump-based systems. There are some geothermal uh, incentives in, uh, potentially available for this project through uh, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, we're pursuing those on some other projects, and, and we'd love to talk to you more about those. Um, I don't have to tell you about renewable energy and, and PV because it's flooded the roof of this building pretty well, um, and, and it's nice to see that commitment. But our process is really engaging through these first three steps with the owner, the facilities teams, the um, a anybody that will want to talk with us about the moving parts in the building so that when we get to step four, which is really going from the AE team and the CM team to the owner team, you're ready to operate this building in the way that it was sustainably designed. So to do that, we actually, let's take a step back. There was a lot of words there. We actually have to do a lot of analysis. So you're seeing examples here of how we do analysis on the massing of the building. So it starts day one. The very first line that gets put onto a drawing has an impact on how well the building performs. So day one, we're looking at radiance um, analysis. We actually also do daylighting analysis to, to make sure that we can maximize the daylight in the classrooms to support teaching and learning, as well as then consider heat gain, because that also can um, decrease your thermal comfort if you have too much of it. But then we also are looking at things like the wind and how it impacts the outdoor spaces. We really want to be able to extend the season of those outdoor learning. So we have a methodology of looking at that, but ultimately we're asking a question, what's the best design if we don't have any power? Now why do we care about that? We, and what do we have to do to design with nature? Why do we care about that? You've got a creek, you've got floodplains going on here. We need to think about resiliency. We need to think about how can we keep your building safe, protect your asset, even if the power does go down. And it's not only just getting kids maybe out of here if the power goes out, like through daylighting, but it's also just making sure things don't freeze <clears throat> and that people are comfortable. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate goal. So you asked about <laughs> system selection, and I think the first thing I would tell you is the system selection will really be your job, it will be our job to bring you the right information for you to make the best decisions for, for your project. Um, this is an example on the screen, again, I know really tricky to read, but we will bring forward very simple uh, one-line diagrams, pros and cons, life cycle cost analysis, so that um, no matter what anybody's background is at the table, technical or non-technical, they can be a participant in the conversation and they can help to make uh, the, the proper decisions. You also asked uh, a, a question about technology versus simplicity, and there's, you know, obviously a, a, a huge love-hate uh, with, with technology in, in these buildings. Um, our, first, our first approach to driving down, dri making these buildings so that they're simple to operate is to have all of the touch points for the users to be as simple as possible, the user interfaces. So the technology that really is required to meet code and be sustainable and have a low building energy use intensity, it has to be there. 
but we, we, we keep some of that behind the curtain, so to speak, and allow the building users to operate in the building in a way that's not intimidating to them and is, is within there. Um, and also uh, c using the building as a teaching tool um, is also a possibility. The last thing I want to say is uh, whether we, you've heard a lot about renovation versus new construction. These are two projects that, um, that RFS is working on now. One is an MSBA project for Webster High School. The other is a, a brand new building for the city of Cambridge. Uh, one is a renovation with a deep energy retrofit of the building envelope. The other is ground up. They're both targeting an EUI of 24. Um, I think the point here is, we can, to, to Jana's comment, we got you covered. I think we can bring home a project that is exemplary, whether whatever the right answer is between renovation and new construction. So Jonathan, you know, we, we talk about renovation and uh, utilizing some of the building. And as structural engineers, we were, uh, LeMessure was fortunate enough to be the original structural engineer for this building uh, before my time, but back in 71. So we went to the archives and pulled up the drawings and started looking at them. And, and uh, we found some great, great opportunities here uh, with the building. First of all, you probably know this, but in, we come in and look at these buildings, 50-year-old schools. They're traditionally masonry bearing walls, uh, steel frame. What you have here is a reinforced concrete, uh, very robust building frame. Um, and that's going to bring three advantages to this project. Uh, number one, as we looked at it, the building and all its components have uh, quite a few what we call structural isolation joints or uh, structural creating uh, separate pods or separate areas of buildings going to make it a little more uh, advantageous if you start to uh, save portions of the building like the auditorium and gymnasium. Uh, second is with the robustness and we have five foot deep uh, girders that run around the building creating very good rigidity. So when you hear, especially in some projects, um, trying to reuse the building and hearing about the seismic and, and wind upgrades that are required and the, the cost that it brings. Uh, this project has some advantages there over some of the other uh, because it, it does have some uh, robust and certainly uh, as you look at this uh, image up that's up there, uh, reinforcing some of that is and strengthening is, is not that difficult. And finally the third which is the most exciting is without bearing walls you could take down the partitions today and have column j just the columns remaining C great flexibility for thinking how the building some could of your be classrooms are undersized yeah. to be able to move partitions around to uh, increase the size of classrooms so they conform with our 21st century learning goals thank you so thanks Bill with that we're going to have some uh, <laughs> exciting discussion around our model and uh, I brought a model because it's a, uh, do you want me to come up there? Okay. Um, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding the mic for you. You guys are the good part. Oh, come on around. Would it, would it be possible for me to ask all of you to come sure. so that we can just be around the model together? <laughs> I wonder if this can probably just get us there. This over here. So we have three ideas, and I know there are three ideas that probably you've already had, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about the way we explore and the means that we use to make complex ideas, complex uh, parameters or... or uh, <laughs> it's not going to work. No, it's not going to work. Uh, oh, they have to hear me. Yeah. It's okay. I'm going to follow you. Uh, complex constraints, understandable to lay people. And I think one of the best ways to do it is three dimensionally. Some people can't read drawings. Uh, it's very difficult for them to read drawings. So we brought models today, and not just for the, the pizzazz of the model, but also to help you understand the way we think. Uh, and also how excellence is going to be brought to Bur Burlington. Uh, it's not just a, a, a question of us demonstrating our facility, but how we can make that work for you and for excellence of education in Burlington. So this is your site. Uh, this is Cambridge Street over here, and this is the existing Burlington uh, High School. You'll notice that, as I said, is half a mile long. We've got some faint lines here which show the extents of the wetlands. So the wetlands, I'm not going to get into the detail of it. There are, there are buffers after which uh, you need to then have a conversation with your conservation folks. They're not hard and fast. For example, a wetlands boundary is 100 feet. But within 50 feet, if you're up between 50 and 100, 
you've got some room to talk to people. So we're assuming the, the 50 foot and the same for, you've got that brook there. That's a 200 foot boundary. Uh, but within 100 to 200 feet, you have some room to talk. Floodplain, we want to make your building resilient. It's not resilient. A part of it is already in the floodplain. So part of any renovation proposal is going to have to be making that portion of the building um, resilient. So this is your building. It's got some advantages, it's got some disadvantages. I'm going to reveal those as we're talking about the, the new proposals. The first thing, while Philip's getting that ready, uh, is that it's entered in a very odd way. <laughs> And it's so strange because it's a building that has such a clear plan. It has two streets, street one and street two, and they're symmetrical, and they have two wings on either side. So doesn't it make sense that um, you would want to enter here, not there? But when you enter this building, all of a sudden it presents as a labyrinth. So I think that's one of the first things that we have to address. We have a, th a scheme B, or a idea B, uh, that we're going to get to in a moment. The first one I wanted to mention is the clearest and the easiest, not because it's the best. And by the way, I have no preference. I think they're all good and they're all feasible. This one is the one that's at the furthest north side of the site. By the way, interrupt me with questions at any point or if there's some misinformation that I have, please let me know. Uh, but I want to hear your questions. Um, the north side of the site is also the narrowest in terms of the encumbrances. So that puts a lot of constraint on the kind of building that you can make. It's also nice because it's visible and there's less, you've got a half a mile less travel uh, to get to it. So I think for a community welcoming purposes, I think that's probably a very good thing. We imagined a kind of building that um, has a frontispiece, which is a core of community uh, type cluster uh, so that the community can immediately get in and uh, enjoy this as a mode of uh, operation. Then the academic wings, by the way, building on what Janice, uh, Jana and Chris said, the first thing to do for sustainability is orientation. So all of these buildings uh, have classrooms, all of these ideas have classrooms that are properly oriented north and south so that they can be more efficient and save money over the long term and so that they can harvest daylight because your kids are going to have 15% better performance if they're in natural daylight than artificial light. So we have the academics back here, a science wing, four clusters which could be for schools within a school. I don't know yet what your educational vision is. Is it vertical houses uh, which are you know grades 9 through 12? Is it cohorts, uh, houses by cohort, or is it departmental? I think it's departmental pretty much right now. But we'll have to decide. But that, this idea of breaking the school down into uh, individual sub-communities is so important for every child to be known, every student to be known by name to one another and to the faculty and to the, and to the administration. So that's one idea. Here's the downside of that idea. Because of the constraint, and there's wetlands here, 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 you're not able to get into those non-academic parts of the building with their own identity and their own sense of address. I think that central administration and uh, your early child, uh, early learning center, they want a different entrance than the front door of the high school. They want to, just as they have now, although now you have that feeling that you're coming around the back. But um, I think that's a problem for this site because we can't get into the back or in, into any other part of it. So everything would have to come through the front, meaning probably you'd want to site a separate building for those functions somewhere else on the site or somewhere else um, in town. I think that's really the nature of this. One other thing I want you to note about this is the way the buildings create outdoor rooms for that outdoor education that we were talking about earlier, which is, I think, so important. So with that, let's now move, oh, by the way, so this is an auditorium, a gymnasium, a media center, a cafeteria. So that's your, that's your uh, core cluster, also available uh, to the community. So let's start here, Philip. Could we t uh, take uh, we A away? Yeah. Well, we can just leave that. Let's take A away. Okay. So yeah, I'll keep that up for that. Okay, so now let's get into the depth of the complex part. How do we renovate this school? Well, the first thing that we do is we're going to
take the existing building, and there just happen to be two pieces. They're identical. Um, it's model making. It's model making. But we're going to add some temporary classrooms. We've got to both probably off-site some of the non-academic functions to make more room for classrooms, if possible. And we've got to add some modulars. So whether we can do this and still allow for emergency access around the back, that's something that we have to think about carefully. These are two-story modulars. That's something that you can do. Uh, and there's also a, a tent-like structure <coughs> that would serve for the um, temporary cafeteria. So what are we doing here? We're renovating. We're going to draw a line right down there through the along Street 2. We're going to take a right, and we're going to keep the so-called rubber gym or rubber floor gym in operation and connected to the rest of this part of the school. And while we're doing that, we're going to modify and do the majority of our renovation work on the rest of the school. So the light blue portions represent parts of the school that are being renovated, and the red portions indicate either new construction or <coughs> they indicate parts of the school that we think need to be heavily renovated or reconfigured. So what's the first thing that you're going to notice about this? Cut we cut a hole in the middle because we got rid of those lightless and viewless science classrooms, which are such a burden to those students. Yay, science! <laughs> let's, Where do let's, these science labs go? Right here. Okay. So we're going right. to build, build a new wing for the science classrooms. They have special size requirements, special uh, uh, service requirements, HVAC and so on. So we're going to build a special wing for them. We're going to make this into a community cluster. Why? Let's invite the community into this building with their own entrance. Let's bring to the gymnasia, the auditorium, the performing arts spaces, and make, give them their own lobby and their own relationship what, up front? to parking. <laughs> And then, as we talked about before, now let's take administration, turn these into classrooms, bring the administration up front so that now the building has a clear and logical wayfinding pattern. So you come into the front door, there's a lobby, you have the administration right in front of you, then there are two streets, Street 1 and Street 2, and you know where you are, you know where you're going. And then finally, in the last phase... Wait, where's the cafeteria? And that is Cafeteria is here. So I, I mentioned major configuration. So the library media center is on two levels. It's now landlocked. By the way, it's not going to be landlocked anymore because we're going to have access now to a library courtyard, an academic courtyard. Uh, but I'd like to find a way to bring light in from the top as well and also to make that into a place which is fully accessible. The elephant in the room about any remodeling of the existing building is accessibility. We have no idea how really you're going to get into the nuts and bolts of making this building accessible. It's on many, many different levels. There's at least 30 feet of change between the front and the back. So I think that's the main, the main obstacle to renovating this building is accessibility. This would imagine bringing the media center to one level probably at the courtyard level, probably meaning demolishing part of that floor in the media center. Also, the cafeteria is not a celebratory space. It's not a place where you want to go, and cafeterias really should be a place that are joyful. So I would imagine popping up the roof of the cafeteria to make it more like the kind of cafeterias that we're seeing in other uh, contemporary schools. So uh, finally, we'll take the rubber gym renovate that, bring, bring all the kids into the newly renovated portions, including level two, uh, and then renovate what they were in on a temporary basis previously, including the rubber gym. Let's look yeah, at one right. more idea. And again, if you have any questions, chime yeah, in. Please, please let me know. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, and then again, we all have to discuss what's staying and not staying, because yes. where would the early learning center go and DCAT and all the other, you know, mm -hmm. multifunctional, I mean, our intent, I, mean, else, I yeah. think some of the pre-talk is we like to try and keep those incorporated, because the kids yeah. do learn from all of them. Yeah. 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 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. For a richer environment. Oh, I'm the comment was where do where where do we put the non-academic spaces uh, in any scheme? And I'm going to give you a specific answer to that in our final idea, uh, which is to have a little bit of both worlds, to have a new building, but also take advantage of the parts of your old building which are fully accessible and which are a great benefit to, to the town because if you were to build a new building from scratch, you probably wouldn't be able to afford to do those two gyms in that large auditorium. So let's keep the gyms in the auditorium. Let's renovate them. Bill thinks they can be renovated. They're robust structures. Uh, we know that you've already put some money into them recently. So now we can uh, do the rest of the job and make them structurally correct and also make them resi resilient because right now that rubber gym is partly into the floodplain. So there are ways to do that. Um, <clears throat> so in this idea, we're going to keep the gym in the auditorium. And we're going to build a new classrooms uh, portion next to it. So the first thing we're going to do is keep the existing school in operation, except for the auditorium and the, what's called the wooden gym. So this is a fully functioning school. We're going to build like one of those walls, like the one that I did in the federal office building. Uh, really hard, hard construction, not, not just a fence or a or something light. It's hard construction to keep the kids fully safe. Then we're going to start building our new school, which is in Philip. <laughs> Build our school, which is also in four parts, and also creates three enclosed outdoor classrooms uh, in between them. And this has the advantage of this site. Uh, that the site is falling off from the front to the back. So these are actually three stories at the back, two stories at the front. So that lower level at the back has its own identity with its own road coming around the back directly fr front. Fr you don't have the feeling of going around the back of, the, uh, of a school. And there will be separate entrances here for central administration and for the early early learning in this so configuration. This looks like it doesn't have room for a road just like the earlier version. So are you saying this is does have more room? It does road have road more road room. Road. There's more width here okay. between the, the wetlands buffers that we think are the viable ones. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. This one is narrow. This one is wider. So we have those individual outdoor spaces. We have actually an, a separate identity for each one of these. If these wanted to be houses and you wanted to have satellite administrations, you could actually have individual addresses for uh, the various parts. Go ahead. Am I running out of time? <coughs> okay. How much time do we have left? Three minutes. Not much. Three <laughs> minutes. Oh, darn. And you didn't get to ask questions. I think you've gotten the idea. Yeah. Uh, we'd like to ask a few questions. So okay. Uh, okay. Do that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, fine. There's just one last piece, which is to renovate that last uh, gym. gym. <coughs> Very good. Okay, and then we yeah, and then we can take the existing building away. That's, that's your new configuration. The auditorium, performing arts, and the two gyms. Yeah. Thank you. I'm good. So can I just ask a quick question? Go ahead. Yeah, so um, Jonathan, thank you for that. Uh, in the RFS, we had put some dates, um, a preliminary schedule, and I'm just wondering, have you looked at that and put any thought into that, think that that schedule is reasonable, or am I going to send that to you in the first conversation we're going to have is, is a disagreement? I don't think there's a disagreement. I think you know that it's it's a it's, it's, it's a somewhat longer schedule than we would normally see for an MSBA project. However, um, I think the more time we have to engage the community, the better. And I imagine that the reason why you made it that way was to allow plenty of time for us to interact with the community. So we like the idea of having an extended schedule where we have a lot of opportunity to go back and forth with your community and help them really feel like they've co-created this new proposal. Thank you. 
And are there any hands up online? We've got to rush because we're tight. None? Okay. And I'll just ask um, one question. There are people who couldn't make it tonight and they emailed me. Um, I'll just say, uh, what percent of your staff are people of color? 45. And um, between Asian, we have African American. Okay. And then what percent of your staff are service disabled veterans? None. Okay. And I think, and then is your firm women owned? It isn't women owned, but we have a majority of women employees. Okay. So I covered some of those questions. So I don't want to take up too much time with. Um, so, uh, again, I don't see any hands up online, uh, so I guess we'll try and wrap this up. I want to say thank you very much for your very detailed uh, presentation and the yeah. models and uh, for all the time you've spent with us. And, um, you know, close this out, and thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for your patience.